Hey, it's Art from My New Microphone. Welcome back to the channel. And in today's video, I want to dive deep into the various compression parameters we have available to us in our compressors so that we can better understand how compressors work and how we can use them in our mixes to achieve better results. Now, I was going to go through and do this in real time in a brand new video. However, I do have an in-depth lesson in my new course, the Mixing With Series Crash Course. And so I'd like to give basically this lesson away to you for free here on YouTube so that one, I can show you a little bit of what the course is about, but mainly to dive deep into the various compressor parameters that we have available to us again, so that we can better understand compression and how to use it in our mixes. So I will roll this lesson. I hope you enjoy it. And if you are interested in the mixing with series crash course, I'll leave a link to that in the description box down below. It will be the second one right after the mixing guidebook that you can get for free. So with that, let's take a deep dive into the basic and advanced parameters that we will find in our compressors so that we can better understand compression and how to use it in our mixes. Welcome to lesson 5.2 compression parameters. We will begin this lesson by having a look at the more basic compressor parameters and then we will move on to the more advanced compression parameters toward the end. And so we will go through everything that you may or may not see on the compressor that you happen to be using or the compressors that you happen to be using in your mixes, just to give you a better idea, not only of how everything works together, but the different terminologies as well that we will see in the various compressors that we have available to us. So for this lesson, I'm going to focus primarily on the kick out because we have a strong transient in the kick drum itself, but we also have a fair bit of bleed in the signal. So we have a strong transient audio right here, but then we don't have complete silence between these transients. So we can gather a better understanding of how a compressor will engage as we exceed that threshold, especially on these transients and how the compressor will disengage in between the transients, even though there's still some audio going on right here. So let's just have a quick listen to the kick out. So you hear that there is significant bleed. The snare drum actually comes through quite heavily on this microphone. So we will apply some compression and hear and see how the various parameters work. So the compressor of choice that I'm going to use for this lesson is another plugin from FabFilter. This is the Pro C2 and I'm choosing this compressor because we have a lot of different controls available to us and it gives us nearly the full gamut of the different parameters that we will see on our compressors. So I think it's a great tool for showing the various compression parameters. And so let's get started with the kick out and the Pro C2 from FabFilter. All right, so let's begin with two of the more easily understandable parameters here. That is the input gain and the output gain. So here in the Pro C2, we see that we have input level and output level. And what I really dig about these FabFilter plugins is that when I hover over any parameter, it will give us a little text box up in this area that will tell us exactly what that parameter does. So better than me explaining it off the top of my head, I can simply read to you these various parameters right here. So the input level is described as the input level slash pan knobs, adjust the overall gain and panning of the input signal before any processing is applied. So with this control right here, we can increase the level before any of the processing in this plugin. It's effectively a gain stage before we reach the gain reduction circuit. And also if we are dealing with an internal sidechain, it will also control the level of the sidechain signal that is feeding into the level detection circuit. So we can bring this down, in this case, all the way to negative infinity and all the way up to plus 36 dB in the case of the Pro C2. And then as you may have guessed, I'll bring that back to zero. The output level is the gain stage after any processing that goes on in the compressor. So after compression, we can apply a bit of output level to increase the gain or decrease the gain to better level match the plugin, whether it is turned on or off. This effectively has the same functionality as makeup gain, which we will get to momentarily, but can be thought of more so as the gain stage at the very output of the plugin, or in the case of hardware, the hardware output gain stage here. So those two are the two easy ones. Now let's talk about the more important basic parameters, 
Most compressors will have these. I will discuss a few other options other than the Pro C2 that are designed a little bit differently between the threshold ratio input and output controls. But for now, let's focus on a more digital style compressor with the standard parameters in the Pro C2. So the threshold of a compressor is a set amplitude limit that dictates when the compressor will engage and disengage according to its attack and release times, which we will get to shortly. As the sidechain level exceeds the threshold, the compressor kicks in according to its attack time once again. And then as the sidechain signal drops back down below the set threshold, the compressor will disengage according to its release time. Lowering the threshold will cause the audio signal to trigger the compressor more often and all else being equal for a longer time. Setting the threshold above the maximum amplitude of the sidechain signal will lead the compressor to never be triggered. So let's play a bit of the kick out right here and I will adjust the threshold and we will see and hear how the compressor reacts. So we see here that we're getting about 2 dB of gain reduction every time that kick happens. Now if I decrease the threshold, see that we are getting more gain reduction. And if I increase the threshold to a point where the input signal or the sidechain signal is never surpassing that threshold, then we get a point where we are never engaging any compression right here. So you can see by this dotted line, this is the threshold. I have it set at negative 6.27. We see that this line is just below this negative six value right here. If I bring this down to negative 12, which is where these peaks of the kick drum are happening, then we see that we are getting a slight amount of compression. Now we have the snares happening somewhere down here around negative 25, 26. So if I bring the threshold down here, then it's really compressing the kicks right here, but it's also compressing a little bit of the snare as well. So, so long as the sidechain signal amplitude is above the threshold, the compressor will be engaged. But as that sidechain signal drops below the threshold, the output becomes directly proportional to the input once again. So in the case where we aren't applying any output level, we will have a ratio of one to one right here. So whatever goes into the compressor comes out of the compressor in terms of level. However, once we surpass this threshold, this ratio changes so that for every dB we have above the threshold, a certain lower amount of decibels will be outputted from the compressor here. And that brings us to our second control right here, which is the ratio. And before we get here, I'm just going to turn this knee all the way to hard to make this a little bit more easy to understand. So looking at these dotted lines right here, we have the threshold. If I set that to a nice number like negative 30, we see that right here, this dotted line is the negative 30 line for the input of the signal level. And then we have our ratio control right here. And you see that as I move this, I'm effectively moving this line right here. And this solid line right here is effectively an input to output ratio. So we see here once again that up to negative 30 dBFS, we have a one-to-one -one ratio where whatever is being put into the compressor is being outputted by the compressor. However, right here, we get to a situation where for every decibel we put into the compressor, we actually get less out of the compressor. And this is determined by the ratio right here. So for example, if we use nice round numbers, this four to one ratio means that for every four decibels the signal is above the threshold, the compressor will only output one dB above that set threshold. And we can see that visualized right here in this graph. So if we had a ratio of one to one the entire way, then we would have effectively no compression happening. Every dB going in would be a dB coming out. However, as we increase this ratio, every dB above the threshold will result in a greater amount of compression. We can go all the way up to a ratio of 100 to one in this case, 
which would be very hard compression, and barely anything would get above this threshold point in the output. Anything above about a 10 to 1 or a 20 to 1 ratio can be considered limiting. And in digital audio, we have brick wall limiters, which are effectively compressors with a ratio of infinity to 1. So let's play back this kick now, and I will make some adjustments to the ratio. and We will see and hear how this compressor acts. So at one to one, there's no compression. Two to one is a fairly gentle compression. As we increase the ratio, we see that the compression gets more and more. Let's go all the way up. So there's a lot more pumping once we get to this 100 to 1 ratio than at, say, 2 to 1 ratio down here. That is effectively how the ratio works. Now, it's worth noting that compressors are continuous in theory rather than discrete. So, for example, a 2 to 1 ratio like what we have here, if I make sure that that's exactly 2 to 1, means that a 0.5 dB input above the threshold would result in 0.25 output above the threshold. Uh, 8 dB input would result in 4 dB output. This is all along a continuous amplitude spectrum, so they are not stepped. It's not like we have to reach exactly 2 dB above the set threshold in order to get 1 dB above. It is continuous all the way along. A compressor ratio will never have a ratio of less than 1 to 1. However, there is an opposite effect to compression known as expansion, which we can discuss a little bit later when we discuss other dynamics processes. Now, by these two controls themselves, the threshold and the ratio, we may see in our mind or get the impression that compression is effectively shaping the waveforms of the signals themselves. So, for example, if we had a very long wavelength or low frequency sine wave, that the compressor would effectively shave off the tops and the bottoms, the maximum and minimum amplitudes of the signal in order to reduce the dynamic range. However, this is more so on the wave shaping side or the distortion side of things. The reason why compression doesn't do this is that we have attack and release times right here. So compressors do not act instantaneously upon the waveforms. And so we don't have this sort of wave shaping that happens unless we have a compressor where we can really get very small attack and release times. We may be able to wave shape low frequencies with an attack time of 0 0.005 milliseconds and a release time of 10 milliseconds, but this isn't typically how compressors are used. So because we have attack and release times, we can think of compression acting more so on the macro dynamics rather than on the intra wave dynamics as distortion, saturation, wave shaping, other effects effects of that nature would do. So speaking of the attack and release time controls, the attack time is the amount of time it takes for the compressor to engage or react once the sidechain signal amplitude surpasses the threshold. The attack and release time parameters in compressors are not delayed action times, but rather rates of change. So in other words, the attack time represents the time it takes for the compressor to go from no compression to its full compression ratio settings. It's not a period of time before the compressor begins working once the threshold is passed. So much like the ratio is a sort of linear movement toward compression, the attack time is not a delay of action. Rather, it's a rate of change or how long it takes the compressor to reach its full ratio once again that threshold is surpassed. So if we had a very short attack time, in this case, the Pro C2 allows a 0 0.005 millisecond attack time, which is incredibly short. At this point, the compressor would act nearly instantaneously to the input signal. So as the input signal surpasses the threshold, the compressor would immediately begin attenuating the signal according to its ratio. As we introduce some amount of attack time, the compressor will take that amount of time to reach its full attenuation ratio. So short attack times really clamp down quickly on the signal to control the dynamics, 
whereas longer attack times can actually allow some of the transient or high level energy of the audio signal to pass through uncompressed before the compressor begins to really clamp down. So we can actually get into situations where we can shape the transients of certain signals using this attack time right here. So for example, on the snare drum, which we will see when we take a look at the proper mix for this song, you'll see in a lot of the percussion and the snare drum, I have very long attack times, which allows that initial attack of the snare to punch through before the compressor clamps down. So I can shape the transients a little bit that way. And moving on to the release time here, the release time is the amount of time it takes for the compressor to fully disengage or to stop attenuating the signal once the sidechain signal drops below the set threshold. Once again, this time control is a rate of change rather than a delay of action. Compressor processes will have some amount of release time. This means that the compressor will remain engaged for some amount of time as the signal level drops below the set threshold. So the release time combined with the attack time allows the compressor to remain engaged so long as the audio signal shows enough signal above the threshold within a set window of time defined as the attack and release times. In general, faster release times can help the sound remain more natural so long as there isn't too much gain reduction happening. Faster release times also increase the perceived loudness of a track by allowing the sub-threshold signal to remain close to, if not at its original level. Slower release times will help smooth out dynamic performances and are often used to push elements a bit further back in the mix in terms of the field of depth. So these are the four most important controls of compressors. We have the threshold, the ratio, the attack time, and the release time. Once again, the threshold is the set level that will get the compressor to begin working. The ratio effectively tells the compressor how much to compress a signal. The attack time refers to how fast the compressor will react to signals as they surpass the threshold. And then the release time refers to how quickly or how slowly the compressor will disengage once the signal level drops down below the threshold once again. In addition to these four controls right here, we typically have a makeup gain. Now, in the case of this compressor, we have a wet gain right here and a dry gain, which allows for easy parallel processing. So we can use this wet gain, which is the gain of the compressed version of the signal to effectively set our makeup gain or we can use this output level right here. Although as we will see momentarily when we take a look at a few other compressors, we will often have a dedicated makeup gain knob that we can use to adjust the gain of the output. And the makeup gain of a compressor, as the name would suggest, is the gain applied to the signal directly after the compression takes place. Makeup gain is typically used to bring the volume of the compressed signal to pre-compression levels, thereby maintaining the same peak level while raising the overall level. This is often essential for gain staging and proper A-B comparison between having a compressor on or bypassed. So because compressors reduce dynamic range by bringing the level of the peaks down or the level of the loudest parts of the signal down, we use makeup gain to bring these levels back up to levels that we had before compression took place. Compressors will typically have makeup gain to bring the peak signal level of the output back to what it was at the input. With the makeup gain set to equal out the peaks, we can hear the compression of the signal more clearly during AV comparison. We may even want to bring the makeup gain slightly below peak matching to achieve more equality and perceived loudness between the signal pre-compression and post-compression for A-Bing purposes. So we will often have a situation where if we match the peak level, we'll actually get a louder signal out of a compressor because we are squashing the dynamic range and making the average level of the signal that much louder when we apply that gain back into the signal. So before we move on to have a look at other compressor types in our plugin options, I want to quickly go over the metering we have available to us in the Pro C2 right here. We've already discussed this graphical metering we have right here, which denotes the threshold, the ratio right here, as well as more advanced parameters, which we will get to shortly, including the knee or the range, you can see how things change right here in this graphical interface as we alter these parameters right here. And then if I play back the kick, we see that we have an audio representation right here where we see the peak levels of the signal going in. We see the amount of gain reduction being applied. So at a threshold of 32 dB, 
negative 32 dB in a ratio of about four to one. We have about six, maybe seven dB of gain reduction on these peaks, the kick drum. And then right here, we have these other meters where we have the input on the left-hand side, the amount of gain reduction in the center, and then the output metering right here. So we will typically have some sort of metering that is good for the amount of gain reduction that we are applying, as well as what the output and or input signal levels are in the compressor. All right, so before we move on to the more advanced compressor parameters, I quickly want to show you a few other compressors just to show you that not all compressors will have all of these controls laid out so nicely. They won't have all of these controls available and they may do compression a bit more differently overall, even though the overall design of the compressor will remain somewhat similar. So the first option I want to show you is a plugin by Waves called the CLA-2A. This is a plug-in emulation of the Teletronics LA-2A, the leveling amplifier from Teletronics. It's an optical compressor. This one is modeled after the LA-2A of Chris Lord Algae, hence the name CLA-2A. And we see here that the CLA-2A is laid out quite a bit differently from the Pro C2. If we put these right next to each other, we see that they are both compressors, but they are both laid out quite a bit differently. So let's have a look more closely at the CLA-2A. So beginning with our main parameters, we have a fixed threshold, a fixed attack time, and a fixed release time in this compressor right here. We do have a little bit of control over the ratio of the signal with this toggle switch right here, where we can choose between compress, which is a lower ratio, or limit, which is a higher ratio. So unlike the Pro C2, we do not have linear control over the ratio. We have two settings right here to choose from where we can do a lower ratio and compress once again, or a higher ratio and limit. Now the threshold is fixed, so we have no control over what the threshold point is. However, this peak reduction knob right here actually controls the signal level of the sidechain signal. So if we drive this peak reduction upward, we're actually increasing the level of the sidechain signal, which will have the effect of increasing the amount of gain reduction applied to the audio passing through. So if I quickly bring up the diagram I had of a basic compressor right here. We see that the sidechain signal right here feeds this level detection circuit. So the higher the level of the sidechain signal right here, the greater the level detection circuit signal will be, this control signal, which means that it will cause more gain reduction in the gain reduction circuit on the input level right here. Now, in terms of input level, we don't have any control over that. However, we do have control over the makeup gain right here in this gain control right here. So we can control the amount of gain reduction going into a fixed threshold by controlling the level of the sidechain signal right here. And then we can control the overall level of the output with this makeup gain control as we see fit in the mix. That's why it was so important for me to discuss the sidechain signal path early on in this module because it is such a vital part of compression. And in this case, we are actually controlling directly the amount of the sidechain signal that is fed to the level detection circuit and therefore the gain reduction circuit. So in addition to the makeup gain control, the sidechain level control, the somewhat limited ratio control right here, and the fixed threshold attack and release times, we also have a mix control for parallel processing. We'll discuss that a bit more in the future, as well as this trim knob, which is an additional level control. We have a very basic high frequency EQ that we can use to adjust the high end of the signal. We have these analog controls, which emulate analog noise that would be produced by this hardware in 50 cycles or 60 cycle systems. And then in terms of metering, we don't have the luxury of having all of those different metering systems that we had in the Pro C2. However, we do have a single VU meter here and we can toggle this VU display between gain reduction, output and input. So by just clicking here, we can switch between those. So let's have a look and listen to what the CLA two-way sounds like on the kick out right here. So I'm set at a lower ratio at compress. I've got quite a bit of gain reduction happening. You can see we're getting almost 10 dB, a little bit more in some cases. Let's AB this. 
bring down this gain so that we can better level match. So it helps thicken up the kick a little bit and you can see there that we have very basic control over the amount of compression caused by the CLA-2A. But this is just another way of laying out the various parameters in this case. So once again, fixed threshold attack and release time, very basic ratio control right here. And then we have the makeup gain right here and the peak reduction effectively controls the amount of gain reduction by controlling the level of the sidechain signal. And we have our basic VU metering right here. One other compressor I want to show you quickly before we move on to the more advanced parameters is one that I have from Slate Digital. It is part of their virtual mix rack. So let's load this one up and it is the FG stress. So once this loads up, we can have a look at that. And what this compressor does is it emulates the distressor by Imperial Labs, which is one of my favorite outboard compressors. It's one of the most famous, I would say, and the most beloved compressors on the market. Here we go, it finally loaded. Get rid of all of these other ones so that we just have the FG stress right here. And so you can see in this layout, let me get rid of this CLA-2A, we have an input control, an attack and release time, and an output control. And we have our ratio control right here. So rather than having a knob or a switch, we actually have individual LED lights that we can go through and select our ratio on. We have a new option that is essentially limiting, and we can also hit this ratio button right here to toggle between the different ratio options. And then we have controls over the audio circuit and the detector circuit right here. So in this case, the detector is essentially acting upon the sidechain signal. So we have some control over that in terms of giving it a boost right here using a high pass filter, linking it to the audio. And then in the audio, we have the same high pass filter right here, along with a few distortion modules right here to emulate the distortion found in the original hardware. So in this case, we have most of the controls, just not a threshold control. And so what we're going to do is actually control the amount of gain reduction by controlling the input going into a fixed threshold. So we have our metering of gain reduction right here in these virtual LED lights right here. And let's have a look and listen to how the input control will control the amount of gain reduction. We'll make sure that we have a ratio above one to one. And right here, we're getting about 9 dB of gain reduction. But you hear there that in order to get more gain reduction in this plugin, we have to drive up the input, which ultimately drives the output of the compressor. So these ones can be a little bit tricky to use when we are first starting out because we don't have that independent control over the threshold, nor do we have independent control over the level of the sidechain signal like we did in the CLA-2A. So anytime we drive up the input in order to get more gain reduction, we are also driving the output of the compressor itself that much more. So controlling the output is very important in terms of this compressor especially when it comes to A-B testing by turning this on and off to get a nice level matching between having the compressor on and off. So let's have a, another listen right here and I will toggle this plugin on and off. I'll also go through a few different ratios here and adjust the attack and release time. So increasing the release time softens it a little bit. A longer attack time really allows that initial transient to poke through. Kind of dulls out the transients when the attack time is short. It's a more appropriate amount of gain reduction. Increase the ratio a little bit. Let's 
hear what nuke sounds like. So a whopping 14 dB of gain reduction here. Adjust that output for level matching. So I was actually lucky enough to use distressors when I was in school and I absolutely loved them. There I do not have hardware distressors, they are quite pricey, but I actually went and downloaded the Slate Digital plugins mostly just to get this plugin right here. There are other options on the market including the arouser by Imperial Labs themselves, which I will be looking at picking up very soon in the future. But for now, this plugin is a pretty great emulation of the Imperial Labs distressor. So with this plugin, once again, we have a fixed threshold and we have an input control that not only drives signal through the entire compressor to the output, but also controls how hard we are pushing up against that threshold and past that threshold. We have our typical attack and release times, as well as our output. Now this is an interesting compressor because there's actually an opto circuit that we can engage in the case of the distressor. If we bring the attack all the way up past 10, the release all the way to zero, and then this ratio to 10 to one, we can actually get more of an optical compressor versus the typical VCA type topology that this compressor has. Once again, we will discuss those in more depth in the next lesson, but that pretty much sums up the basic compressor parameters. So let's now move on to the more advanced compressor parameters. So let's have another look at the FabFilter Pro C2 right here. And let's start with auto gain right here, which we can select on and off. What auto gain does is it automatically sets the makeup gain of the compressor so that it has the same perceived loudness whether the compressor is turned on or off. And as we increase the amount of gain reduction as we are setting up our compressor, the auto gain will automatically adjust the amount of makeup gain so we aren't getting drastic variations in the output signal level as we go through and adjust our settings of the compressor itself. So personally, I stay away from auto gain. Typically when I'm mixing, I prefer to set that myself so that I can really hone in on the level matching for A-B testing. I find depending on what compressor you're using or I'm using, and I use a lot of different compressors, the auto gain feature can be different from one to the next and doesn't always give me the results I want out of the makeup gain of the compressor. So that is what auto gain is. Auto release, as the name would suggest, automatically adjusts the release time according to the transients of the signal. In fact, we can hover over this right here and get a detailed description of what it does in the Pro C2. So it says here, when auto release is enabled, the release time is determined automatically depending on the current amount of gain reduction. Using the release knob, you can adjust slash scale the overall effect of the auto release on the release time. So what this does is it basically aims to get the compressor to completely disengage before the following transients. So if we have faster transients in the sidechain signal, the auto release will be a bit faster. And if we have a little bit of a slower, more drawn out sidechain signal, then the release may be a bit slower. It's trying to automatically set the release time to give you the best results, whatever those best results may be, depending on, again, whatever compressor you are using. So personally, I don't like to rely on the auto release. I use it from time to time, but usually I will go through and try to set the release to the best of my abilities rather than relying on the compressor to do it for me. Because once again, different compressors will have different either algorithms or settings that they use to determine what the best auto release time would be. For example, if we go to another great waves plugin, the SSL compressor, we see that it too has a auto release right here. And this plugin right here is emulating the solid state logic G master bus compressor from the 4000 series. Whereas this compressor right here, the Pro C2 is a digital compressor. So it's not based on any particular hardware. And so the auto release may be a lot cleaner on this one than it would be on this emulation, but cleaner doesn't always necessarily mean better either. Either way, I usually stay away from the auto release time, but I digress on that point. 
Moving on, we have our look ahead control, which is right here. And we must engage this in the case of the Pro C2. So we could turn look ahead on. And look ahead is a control that allows a compressor to effectively see the sidechain signal so that it can react more quickly to compress the program or input audio. Increasing the look ahead time can allow the compressor to handle transient information better and maintain a smoother attack because it effectively delays the input or program audio so that it can react to the sidechain before the input or program audio passes through the gain reduction circuit. So look ahead is achieved by duplicating and delaying the incoming program signal and using the earlier signal as the sidechain. And so in the case of the Pro C2, we can have a look ahead at zero milliseconds, so no look ahead, and we can adjust this all the way up to 20 milliseconds. So if we play this back, we can hear and hopefully see that the compressor will be acting before the actual kick drum comes through. And if we bring the look ahead all the way back, little bit sharper if we bring down the attack time so the compressor is acting to reduce the gain before the peak of the kick drum right here hopefully you can see that if we bring the look ahead all the way back hopefully you can see that the gain reduction is happening immediately at the peak because we have, again, this very short attack time right here. So look ahead is, like I said, very useful for adjusting the gain reduction so that we can better handle the transients of a signal. I find it's useful for limiting when we really don't want any signal level to surpass the set threshold. I don't use it that often for compression by itself, but it is a useful advanced parameter to be aware of and to use in some instances in your mixes. Moving on, some compressors have a knee control. And so the knee of a compressor refers to the transition point around that compressor's threshold where the output becomes attenuated versus the input. So a hard knee, as we see right here, offers a more distinct triggering of the compressor, while a soft knee, if we go all the way out, offers a smoother and more gradual transition into compression. So I had this knee setting right here all the way to hard or zero dB in this case, because it's easier to teach compression in this way. In a hard knee, we have the case where as soon as something surpasses the threshold, it becomes compressed. However, as we soften the knee right here, you see that compression starts happening a little bit before the set threshold and the full ratio in this case, 3.84 is not actually realized until a little bit above the threshold right here. So the knee kind of smooths things out in this manner. In digital compressors, we can have a very hard knee. In other compressors, it may be a bit softer. And in very new or tube style compressors, we have a pretty soft knee compression, which is much more program dependent, but I'm getting a little bit ahead of myself. We will talk about that in the next lesson. In the case of stereo plugins, for example, if I go here to the Plugin Alliance Shadow Hills Class A Mastering Compressor right here, we see that we have a stereo compressor where we have independent control over the left and the right channels right here. And while this is pretty intimidating, just looking at it like this, we can set the parameter link right here so that we have stereo linking. So anything I do on the left side or the right side will be mimicked on the other side right here. So without parameter link or stereo linking on right here, we would have complete independent control over the left and right channels. However, with the stereo link, or in this case, the parameter link right here, we can have things linked as we see fit. So stereo linking is an important feature of true stereo or dual mono type compressors like this. We don't necessarily have those parameter options on the previous compressors that we had a look at. So I wanted to show you in this Shadow Hills Class A mastering comp quickly right here. In addition to stereo linking, we also have mid side processing right here. So in a stereo setup like this, we have the left and right controls right here. However, we can also set this to control the mids 
and the sides rather than the left and the right. So the mids and sides of a stereo audio signal are perhaps erroneous terms. A better way of describing them would be sum and difference. So the mid channel, quote unquote, would be everything that is the same between the two stereo channels, the left and the right channel, or the sum of those channels. So if we were to sum a stereo track into mono, that would be the mid channel. And then the sides is everything that is different between the left and the right channel. So if we were to sum the stereo track into mono, the sides would be everything that was lost from that summing. So with mid side compression, in this case, we have this toggle. We can control the compression that we apply to the mids independently of the compression that we apply to the sides. Beyond mid side processing, let's open up our virtual mix rack right here to have another look at the FG stress. And you see that we have a few distortion algorithms right here. And these are just advanced parameters that allow us to color the signal a little bit more. If we have a listen, I can toggle between these two distortions. And it's not only the FG stress that offers these different flavors of compression. We also have different styles right here in the Pro C2, clean, classic, opto, vocal, mastering for different styles. And another great way of demonstrating the coloration algorithms is actually with the stock compressor from Logic. Right here in the distortion tab, we have different coloration, including soft distortion, hard distortion, and clipping distortion right here that we can choose from in the mix. Now, you probably didn't hear it all that much in just the kick right here. So let's actually bring over the distressor to the mix bus over here. We will choose a stereo version and let's have a listen to the various distortion settings of the distressor or the FG stress right here. Make sure that the mix bus is soloed. So that's very distorted. And a bit less so. So coloration algorithms can be super important for giving a little bit of harmonic saturation or character to the audio passing through the compressor. Beyond that, we can move back to our kick over here and talk about range. So we'll open up the Pro C2 once again and we have a range control right here. And what it says here is the range slider limits the maximum amount of applied gain stage. Compare this to the ratio slider, which scales the dynamics behavior instead. So let's bring this back to a hard knee and we'll have a look at this graph right here. So if I bring the range back right here, we can set it so that we have a maximum of let's say 10 dB of gain reduction. So at a ratio of say five to one, we have a maximum amount of gain reduction that can be applied set to 10 dB. So we have a one to one ratio all the way up to the threshold where we hit the hard knee. And then we have compression happening at a ratio of five to one. And then as soon as we reach that maximum range of 10 dB of gain reduction, we get back into a one to one ratio right there where whatever exceeds that amount of compression will be at a one to one ratio input to output once again. So let's play back the kick right here. Let's bring down the threshold. And you can see here that as we are getting more than about 10 dB right here, we're actually reaching a point of one to one ratio right here. You can see this green hitting beyond the curve right here where we have the five to one ratio. And finally, we have our hold control right here. So if I hover over this, the hold slider sets the time with which peaks in gain reduction will be prolonged. Applying a bit of hold time can help increase the transparency of gain reduction. With longer hold times, you can achieve nice pumping effects.
So the hold time in this case basically prolongs the amount of time before this release control comes into play. So once the compressor begins to reduce the gain, we can hold that for a set amount of time, regardless of when that sidechain signal drops below the set threshold. And then after this hold time has gone through, the release time will trigger. So it's just another way that the compressor can shape the amount of gain reduction in terms of the time parameters here with the hold control. And finally, before we wrap up this lesson on compressor parameters, I want to talk about the sidechain parameters that we have, where we can often control the level of the sidechain, much like we did in the CLA-2A with this peak reduction control right here. But we also often have some control over the EQ of the sidechain signal right here. So for example, in the Pro C2, we have a high pass filter, a single parametric band right here that we can use to increase or decrease certain frequencies of the sidechain signal. And then of course we have our low pass filter right here. So with this, if there are certain frequencies in the sidechain signal, whether it's internal or external, we can make the compressor more sensitive to those frequencies and react more so to those frequencies than others. Or if there is a lot of low end rumble that would otherwise cause the compressor to react a bit inappropriately, we can actually get rid of those in the sidechain signal right here so that they do not affect the gain reduction circuit of the compressor or the virtual gain reduction circuit of these plugins right here. We also often have an addition control right here where we can actually listen directly to the sidechain rather than the output of the compressor. And we also have a toggle right here to choose between an external sidechain or an internal sidechain. In Logic, the key for external sidechain inputs is always found up here if available in the top right corner. So for example, if we wanted to sidechain the kick to something else, we could choose from any other audio signal, say the horn room, the toms, the hi-hats, the backup vocals, what have you or we could sidechain it to an input, like my voice right here that is coming in on input one, or even a bus, so any of our subgroups right here, or our effects returns if we wanted to. And we can have a look at, say, the stock compressor from Logic. We have our sidechain panel right here. So we can also choose the detection mode to go on the RMS value of the sidechain or the peak value of the sidechain signal, the maximum or the sum. We can also choose to filter the sidechain here with a variety of different filter types right here, like a high shelf, parametric EQ, high pass, band pass, or low pass. We have frequency control here, Q control, and gain if we go to the parametric or the high shelf. And if we look, for example, number three, at the FG stress, we again have these options on the detector right here where we can link it to the input. We can boost a frequency right here or we can high pass it right here. And if I'm not mistaken right here, this boost is a six kilohertz boost to help increase the sensitivity of the detector or the sidechain signal in the mid range. So that's what I have for you in terms of the advanced compressor parameters and the basic compressor parameters. Hopefully you took in a lot of this information. Feel free to rewatch this important lesson whenever you need a little jog of the memory on the various parameters for compressors. Getting a solid idea of how all of these work across a variety of compressors, especially the ones that you like to use in your mixes, will prove invaluable in your mixing journey. So I encourage you to rewatch this if you need to, and to also reference the Mixing with Compression ebook that goes into written detail on these parameters and much more in terms of compression. So with that, we will end this lesson. And in the next lesson, we will have a discussion on the various compressor types, and we will have a look at even more goodies in terms of compressor plugins here in Logic Pro. So I look forward to that lesson. I hope you do as well, and I will see you in the next one. All right, I hope you found that clip informative. Once again, that is a lesson from the Mixing with Series Crash Course that goes in depth about mixing with faders and pan pots, mixing with EQ, compression, saturation, delay, reverb, automation, and of course we have modules on preparing the mix for mixing and finalizing the mix. 
So if you're interested in that, it is the second link in the description box down below that you can check out. The first link is to a free resource I put together for you. It is my mixing guidebook, which will give you a strong workflow to go through and improve your mixes almost instantaneously. So click on one of those two links if you are interested. And if you'd like to hang out with me more here on YouTube, I would encourage you to hit that subscribe button, hit the like button for this video, and to check out one of these two videos up here in the top left or top right corner. So do what you got to do. Click on one of those videos. And I'll see you in the next one. Cheers.